Can we record? Yeah. All right. So it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce one of my oldest friends. Actually, uh, Peter and Malcolm. Uh, there's Peter. You guys are uh, an old uh, uh, connection or a group of uh, friends. And Jimson, myself, and Derek go way back to the 1990s. It's hard to believe. Met Derek at UBC, and then Derek introduced me to Jimson. And uh, it's been really great to see how Derek's developed and uh, throughout the years and is probably one of the foremost sprint coaches in the world. Uh, he's mm -hmm. worked with Charlie okay. Francis. Uh, he's uh, uh, taken a lot of knowledge from Charlie and basically has developed a lot of his own stuff, which is very formidable and very uh, groundbreaking and pioneering. And uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot I can say about Derek. Uh, he's, uh, he's really good at what he does and he's been, um, uh, how do you say he's collaborated and worked with a lot of professional sports teams in the NFL, the NHL, um, NBA, uh, Derek and I go way back. We worked together with them at the Milwaukee Bucks. Derek's been a really good, uh, friend and influence on, uh, helping me with my micro stretching. So, uh, I can go on for another 45 minutes, but I'll let Derek take over. And uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Derek to uh, this uh, micro stretching live or recovery regeneration, uh, a Zoom conference thing. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Nick. Um, I apologize in advance for wearing a green shirt with a green screen because my head looks like it's like separated from my body here. But <laughs> <clears throat> that's the only way I can get a decent looking bookcase behind me. I have like different libraries from around the world, but I thought I'd go with this one. So um, yeah, so uh, I guess what I'm here to talk about is essentially uh, kind of electrical muscle stimulation and how I've used that. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about sort of like the return to play process because that's usually how I, I frame it. But I mean, recovery is all part of that. And I'll talk uh, about, you know, different types of stimulation I've used over the last 25 to 30 years. So it's, um, it's something that I use. I would say I use it daily because I, I got three kids who are all very athletic and, and they get hurt or they need recovery. So my, my son plays football and you know, we got him back on the turf and doing stuff in cleats and he's very sore. And, you know, we pretty much, uh, nipped that in the bud right away. We do a whole protocol around electrical stimulation and the next day he's ready to go again. And, and, and I'm pretty impressed. The other extreme example is my mother who's 79 had a stroke back in April and it was pretty severe from what the doctors tell me. The neurologist said that the left side of her brain was essentially a, a large part of it was, um, damage significantly. Um, so we, we essentially started in with different types of electrical stimulation, some local for different muscles, but also, uh, circulation and, um, also some, uh, transcranial stuff that was very interesting as well. And so she's back, um, still has some vocabulary issues, but certainly full motor function, um, working in the garden, cooking, um, uh, she cuts hair, so she cuts all the grandchildren's hair, all motor, full motor function back. So that's been pretty interesting too. She's been a bit of a guinea pig for me to kind of try it on the stroke rehab side. And I think it's worked pretty well. So um, the, only, the only disappointment for me is I, I, the doctors that I was talking to um, never really worked with this kind of technology extensively. None of the rehab people. So there's lots of people out there with strokes who don't have access or just don't get it recommended, which is, which is kind of sad. But uh, other than that, we've, we've had some pretty good results. So I'll, I'll share my screen and I'll get into sort of the RTP uh, rehab sort of stuff that I use the stim with and then talk also about performance and recovery. And if you have any questions, just, just jump right in. Um, So I'll usually um, talk about electrical stimulation uh, as part of the RTP process, but, but there's really a four primary applications that I use it for, um, you know, post-injury, but also in a rehab sense, even just muscle soreness. So I can contract the muscle. So there's an activation component. So just getting the muscles moving, somebody sitting down, we use it a lot in terms of uh, working with pro teams. Um, 
finish the game, showers, hit the bus on the plane. So we have athletes using it right after the game in terms of just pulsing and circulation um, and just getting the muscles working in a passive sort of low intensity mode. But just so you know, we, the, the Las Vegas Knights, the hockey team, they bought a whole bunch of stims from us and, and hopefully they beat the Vancouver Canucks in the series. But anyways, um, reduce muscle tone, uh, any tension, any, you know, whether it's glutes, hamstrings, quads, uh, shoulder, neck, um, just the pulsing ability of the muscle stim can bring down muscle tone and, and just reduce tension. Some of that also creates pain. So in general population, we have a lot of low back cases, low back uh, pain, chronic low back pain. So we'll use it on obviously low back glutes, hip flexors, hamstrings, and that definitely brings down uh, their muscle tension and generally their overall uh, feeling and perception of pain. So also with the pain, we can use things like TENS uh, to sort of uh, override some of the pain signals and bring down pain so that people can exercise. And that's been another application of just bringing down pain and especially in general population. Now they're like, okay, now I can do the prescribed exercises. And then it starts that whole cascade of, of just good things happening as part of their rehab. And like I said, just general improvements in circulation um, are very, very beneficial. Long trips, I did a trip to Japan a couple of years ago, had the stim on the whole way. I think it was like a nine hour flight, 10 hour flight, walk off the plane, feel like really didn't have uh, much of a sit down at all. So I'm, I'm thinking about all the different applications based on um, the different functions within, within the muscle stim itself, the unit. This is an example of, of doing it for an ACL rehab where this athlete was constantly um, you know, he did, he's a professional football player and did his rehab initially with the team, but we, we got him and he didn't have full extension, um, passive or active, uh, in the left knee. So we were doing a lot of quad stimulation at the same time, trying to get him to full extension, doing things with the band. So, and terminal knee extension type movements. And we found that contracting the quad while he stretched the hamstring really helped because that reciprocal inhibition component of firing the quad while we're trying to elongate the hamstring really uh, sort of increased his recovery time in terms of getting him back to full extension. He's training with me now, you know, doesn't, doesn't miss a beat in terms of his stride and his extension. Now um, we'll do some contract relax with the stretching. And I've talked to Nikos about doing this with some of the micro stretching where we'll do a pre-contraction um, in the, like I said, the hamstring, then we'll stretch the quad. So this is the opposite of what you saw in the previous example is fire the, fire the hamstring, get a loosening in the quad, reciprocal inhibition, and then stretch the quad. So both in his cases for extension and flexion post ACL uh, surgery, we found that this worked a lot better than just conventional stretching. And this is another example here of just getting a quad contraction while he's doing sort of a, a conventional sort of calf stretch or pushing, pushing on the, the rack there and getting him to extension, adding the band in there as well, just to remind him to push to extension and he can change the intensity on the quad or pause it in between these types of stretches. So we found that very useful. Uh, this is another ACL rehab, another football player, and we're just doing it superimposed with his squatting, and trying to get the quad to fire as part of the movement. And he can time it, he can pause it, he can start it up again. And we find, again, this really helps with accelerating his function. And, and whenever there's an acceleration in function, we find that you know other things start to subside in terms of pain, uh, edema, uh, swelling. So I just found that using the stim and there's kind of a gamification piece. Like, so if he has control over it, he's pushing buttons, it's a little more interesting than just, just doing a squat by itself. Plus he feels the benefit of the stem contracting as part of that movement. He gains confidence. Eventually we wean them off the stem and they're doing conventional training. Um, and this is just a more extreme example of doing a pretension, turn on the stem. He does an eccentric drop into a split. And again, he just feels like it's just contracting a little more, uh, effectively as part of this uh, without it he just 
would drag a little bit more. The timing of the contraction would be a little late. So I, I think there's a huge, I hate to say it, but placebo confidence effect of using this technology as well. So <clears throat> there are different uh, areas that we try to hit with electrical muscle stimulation. Like I said, pain mitigation, muscle recruitment, tone reduction, range of motion improvement, and circulatory enhancement. We go through all of these different things and, and ultimately we work back into sort of a superimposed acyclical exercise, a squat, a lunge, a step up, depending on, you know, if, if it's a lower body injury, if it's upper body, we'll do the same thing with shoulder and and uh, I've had people with bicep tears and pec tears, and we've done sort of the same process where we pick an acyclical exercise and work on strengthening. Um, and then eventually we work to voluntary cyclical exercise. So in our case, running, um, doing the drills and doing the running, we take the stem off and everything seems to work a lot smoother. They have the strength, they have the confidence. So I have over 25 years with all sorts of stim, like I said, EMS, TENS, interferential, Russian stim, transcranial stimulation, different brands. Um, you know, most, most of the stims out there are pretty good. Obviously, you see things like a Dr. Ho or things you can buy on Amazon or at Costco. And um, I usually try to go with a reputable company. So Globus, Compex, I have a number of those. Um, and, you know, I'll go through a, a couple of other technologies as well. But um, most of the time, the, the stuff is pretty good. Even some of the cheaper stuff is still useful um, if, if somebody is on a budget. Um, I'll talk a bit about sports performance and return to play applications some more. And I've, I've also done some work on uh, some paralysis cases, quadriplegic, uh, paraplegic, and even just some of the simple things in terms of getting rid of tremors, um, helping with just pain and discomfort in certain areas of the body. Certainly we haven't cured anybody, but, but certainly managing the process, uh, you know, once they've had um, their injury and their surgery and all that and bringing them back, we've had a lot of positive uh, cases in terms of just improving the function that they have. Um, I think a lot of this uh, work in electrical stimulation uh, revolves around this concept of stochastic resonance. So when you just in, in, introduce noise into a system, it can help improve the function of that system. And, and, and this is something I came across. I can't remember who brought this to my intent, attention, but it certainly uh, makes sense in terms of a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing, whether it's um, implant, implanted electrical stimulation in the spinal cord for managing pain or even improving uh, lower body function. And some people think, well, it's helping with the contraction, but I think just introducing noise into the system helps the transmission of a signal. Um, and there's examples of that in other cases. So um, using um, vibration therapy to help with posture. So you put elderly people on a vibration plate and it improves their ability to balance and stand and even improves their strength. Um, visual systems, so they introduce noise into a visual system. Um, it can help improve visual acuity. Um, another example of whole body vibration, reducing musculoskeletal pain, and also introducing white noise into a room where kids have ADHD. Um, a quiet room is actually more um, disruptive than actually introducing white noise. They tend to, to, to function and, and, and focus better. So I think that's what a lot of electrical stimulation does is it just helps us to focus a little better and get the signal through. Um, with some of the transcranial stuff, like I do have a, a pair of these, um, uh, I think they're called Halo Sport uh, headphones and you see the little, um, these are little sponge spikes and you wet them and you put them on your head. And I've done a pre-exercise, like, and again, I'm 51. I, I don't really have the same enthusiasm about exercise as I did maybe 30 years ago, but I train with my son, we lift weights. I'll put that on 20 minutes before. And I'm like, wow, this feels like a really, really strong cup of coffee. It does get me going. So there's certainly something going on there in terms of what's happening in your brain and your perception of what may be happening. I, I think they found with the transcranial, they found that it doesn't necessarily penetrate the skull, but it certainly creates some activity up in that area that maybe your brain 
kind of responds to, um, but it's, it's definitely not sig sending uh, electricity through your skull. So it's a little different than actual implants that they've been using. And the fellow that, that was on the, I think the CEO of Halo was a, a neurologist who did work with implantable electrical stimulate brain stimulation for things like epilepsy and tremors and things like that. So there is something there. There's something to it. Maybe it's that stochastic resonance piece. Um, it actually works, electrical stimulation. I know I have lots of studies if anybody wants to see some of the recent research on it, it works. There's studies that show it doesn't work, but a lot of time when I go through those studies, I look at how the study was conducted and maybe the intensity wasn't high enough. Maybe they choose the wrong frequency. And so there's, there's ways to, to make it work for you. The new technology is portable and convenient. Um, a lot of it is alternating current base. There are some DC devices out there as well, which I'll talk to about. Uh, it can be very precise and easily quantified. I'll talk a bit about that and how I use it in both rehab and performance training uh, as a diagnostic tool. I think it makes you a better coach uh, in a lot of ways. Um, it just gives you more information. And um, I find it's just a safe way to introduce a profound stimulus stimulus that kind of creates adaptations and changes in the body. And again, I, I still think that a lot of this may be a placebo effect, which I have no problem with, honestly. <clears throat> so in basic terms, you're, you're contracting the muscle. A lot of time with the pad placements, you're trying to put it not necessarily in the middle of the muscle and not at the extreme ends. So somewhere in between, and you're trying to get a shortening of the muscle. Um, there's some interesting things you can do to find out where the exact placement should be because it changes an individual. So we'll do things like uh, put gel all over a muscle and then we'll, we'll kind of float the pads around and see where it picks it up best. So sometimes when I'm doing quad, you know, different placements on the VMO can be interesting because some people react a little differently. So it is useful to sometimes find your own placements uh, based on who you're working with and not necessarily just go with generic placements. Um, but certainly there's something going on between uh, the stimulator and the muscle. But I think there's other things that are going back to the brain that are telling people like, hey, things are working fine here. Um, we can contract the muscle. And essentially that's what I do in a rehab sense for joint injuries is we'll try to get the muscle contracting properly with the stim. And then we'll start to load the muscle more conventionally. And it just tends to work better. Not And part of it is you're working on recruitment and you're improving your recruitment. But the other part of it is it's creating almost a safe environment to actually get into conventional training. And I think it's that, that afferent messaging that goes back to the brain and the spinal cord. And it says, yeah, everything's good. Everything is working fine here. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I don't know if there's a lot of research out there about that aspect, but I certainly see it with, with patients and when athletes. So here are some examples of some of the superimposed things we do. So like I said, basic squat to a bench, uh, posting up with the, the plate there and making them put a little more force into that injured side and using the stem and then doing step ups. Those are some common things we do for knee injuries, glute, hip, low back, and they seem to work very well. Um, the pulsing I use for active recovery tone management. You'll see some um, some units have massage uh, as part of that classification too, but it's just basically pulsing, right? We also do isometric contractions, whether it's again, immediately uh, post uh, surgical in like an ACL, I'll get them working on just getting that isometric contraction in a safe way on the quad pretty soon after surgery because we don't want to experience much in the way of atrophy. Uh, we'll do the superimposed exercise, squatting, lunging, step ups, um, the PNF applications we've had a lot of success with too. So rather than pushing on somebody and, and trying to get them to uh, get a contraction pre-stretch, we just fire, we get them to fire up the, uh, the stem. Okay. Turn on boom. And then we'll do a stretch and we get that increased range of motion. So it's a safe way to do a PNF like uh, stretching protocol. Um, the 10 stuff is interesting because obviously it, it kind of dulls the pain, but we found some interesting stimulatory effects. Like I'll do um, tens, high intensity tens on bottom of feet, uh, pre-exercise and people respond very well to that. I think it's just a sensory thing, but you know, stimming the feet has been very, very uh, useful. Um, the diagnostic tool I'll get into because if, like I, I used it on my father. Again, he's late seventies. He has, you know, previous ACL injury. 
So he had some swelling and some uh, atrophy in one of his legs. So when I put it on his good leg, I think it was about uh, the unit I was uh, using. It's not in milliamps, but it's just, it's a compact unit. So they go zero to a 999. So the scale would be, I put it on his good leg. It was 30 points to get it to contract on his bad leg where he had the injury, it took about 120 to 150 points. So you see the difference. So whenever something is irritated, injured, swelling, um, any previous injury, it'll always take more milliamps to get that to fire, right? Because there's an inhibitory effect happening. And they've also, there's a study where they show that when people are fatigued um, or have sort of heat exhaustion and those types of things, it'll take more electricity to fire things up. So it's a good way, you know, bilaterally to look at right versus left and compare. So in his case, 30 for good, 150. The other thing is I put it on my son, who's 16 years old, very fast twitch. Uh, it takes about eight to 10 of those points to get both of his quads fired up. So something to do with youth as well. Um, you know, he's very, 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 very fresh and twitchy and all that. It doesn't take much electricity. So if you're really healthy, you need less electricity to get things firing. If there's something bad going on, and we even found this in my mom's situation too, because they did a, uh, they did the TPA uh, for as part of the stroke, and then they um, they were going to catheterize her through the femoral nerve, femoral artery, sorry, um, in her leg. Uh, they didn't go there, but they did do the they did do the puncture, and then she bled all through her leg. So there's a lot of bruising down her leg, and that leg it took a lot of time and electricity to get things pulsing uh, again, you know, and again, it was a left brain injury. So we think there was something going on there as well, but we've got things kind of leveled out. So if you're working with somebody, you're trying to get them to sort of an equal sort of reading on the stem to kind of give you an indication of both readiness and, and just general health. So it's, it's very interesting. I use it a lot now for all of my uh, RTP um, cases and I'm noting exactly what the settings are after each session, and we do start to bring things together. Knee replacements, um, everything. I, I'm using it on everything now. Um, stimulation frequency in conventional EMS, uh, one to 40 hertz is gonna be more of the pulsing and I would say endurance muscle, type, type one muscle. Then you get into intermediate, which 40 to 70 hertz. And if you're working with very fast twitch people, 70 to 120 hertz is going to be more effective. And you'll notice it. You put it, I put it on my wife. She's more of a middle distance runner. You know, we have to find the right frequency for her. I put it on myself. You know, I wasn't incredibly fast, but certainly faster than my wife. And then I'm in the upper ranges where I get a better contraction. So understanding which frequency to use for different applications, which is interesting because I work with an Olympic weightlifter and I'll talk about this a bit more. She's the 2012 Olympic champion in Olympic weightlifting in London. She had a knee injury. Uh, we worked on just 70 to 120 hertz because I'm thinking, okay, that's where she's had most of her atrophy. And so when she lifted, she's fine. Oh yeah, I can squat, I can front squat, I can press, right? But when she went to go walk her dog after training, she had a lot of pain. So what I had neglected was I didn't do any sort of type one uh, rehab with her. So we started shifting her and dividing the sessions. One day would be, uh, I think it was around 34 hertz, 34 or 35 hertz. And we just did that on the quad for a couple of weeks. Pain disappeared. She could walk her dog and she could go up and down stairs. So the low load stuff was restored because we started switching um, the, the frequency occasionally. So very interesting. And this was, this was her example of when we first started working with her, she had these deficits as well. So healthy was the right side, left side was like a irritated meniscus or something going on in her, her left knee. And then just over time, we started to narrow that gap and she started to get restored by about eight, eight or nine weeks. We were even, but I think it's, it's a very, very um, useful tool just from a diagnostic point of view. And that's uh, in the PT clinic that I help out in. We use it all the time as part of our diagnostic. We, we hook people up, see where people are, and we show them as we go along, this is why, this is how you're improving. We can show you with this. How do you feel? Yeah, it feels better too. So it's nice to have those things kind of jive together. And also for cases where there's swelling and edema, when that swelling comes down, pain disappears, but also we have function improving as well. So, and this is one of the studies 
uh, EMS detects fatigue induced by prolonged exercise in the heat, um, where they found those same differences in terms of activation using electrical stimulation. Um, and that's a device, again, you'll see the difference. This was on a fellow that had an ACL rehab. You know, it, it's usually going to be at least a 50% difference or, or twice as much electricity needed to fire something up. I've seen 25 and I've seen up to about 80 or 100. Um, you know, so it depends on the severity of the injury and the, the condition of the muscle. And uh, these are other examples of using it. Um, this is just the pulsing. And we're just doing this on him just to, to reduce some of the, uh, the swelling in the knee. So I don't really use ice anymore. We just use the stim and we have very good results. So, oops. So yeah. So that's, that's, that's kind of my quick, quick and dirty uh, presentation. Hopefully that was useful. Um, like I said, I'm using it every day. Uh, use it on myself, uh, use it on my kids. We don't have any pets. Uh, although I did have a pet who had some hip issues and I, I, I did use it on him and uh, it did produce some degree of comfort, I guess, but I had to shave them down and, and put the pads on there and stick them on. It was just a process. So I know they use it a lot on horses. So Duke was a big dog too. <laughs> oh, he's yeah. the biggest Weimaraner I've ever seen. No, no, this is really good. Thanks, Derek. Um, it's very, very fascinating because I've been talking with Derek uh, over the years about the use of EMG and stretching and, and the application. And what, one thing that's really stuck, to, stuck with me with regards to EMG, too, is I don't know if you guys are aware of Valdemar Matuszewski, who used to be with Charlie Francis, but I remember Valdemar's specialty, his PhD, was EMG. EMS. And, oh. EMS, sorry. Yep. Sorry. That's right. EMS. I stand corrected. Uh, EMS. And uh, Valdemar told me one, once that he actually had Ben Johnson hooked up all the muscles for, uh, for sprinting. And he had his muscles fired in a way where they were sequential. And this unit he had was about, I think, 10 or 12 leads. And he had Ben Johnson firing his muscles in a way where he was running a sub 10. 100 meters. So it's really, really fascinating what you can do with EMS stuff. Now, this is fantastic. Any questions for Derek? Well, I've got one actually. Um, a while back, um, I remember reading, I think it was on the um, Charlie Francis forum, there was something about using EMS to prepare the foot to deal with more force than it would actually experience in running. Um, have you got any experience using that in particular? Uh, would, you, would you recommend like locations, particular muscles to target? And have you had any other applications where you prepared the foot for a certain way using EMS? Yeah, I, I would say that's the one. It's, it's, if you do it on yourself, it's not, I'm not going to say it's unpleasant, but it certainly feels very odd, right? Like it's not something because I, I guess, you know, most people have sensitive feet. Like I'll, I'll, I'll use it on my wife before she goes for a longer run. And she always has great things to say about it in terms of like how she felt, um, just the perception of, of how her, her stride felt and her ground contacts. Um, so we've done more and more of that with, with uh, even just rehab patients of stimulating the feet because that's their first really I guess, interaction with the ground, right? Like that's where it, it starts first. So if you can improve that, it really helps. So um, it's, just, it's just building people up to that point where their tolerance is higher because when you initially do it, most people are like, pardon the pun, but pretty shocked with like the sensation. So you have to kind of bring them along gradually. But all we do is we just stick them, you know, on the soles of the feet uh, underneath the ball of the foot and just, just ahead of the heel and uh, we start with some light stim and we always do it in the standing position. And um, it, is, it is very positive. So I would say uh, in any rehab now, I will, you know, if it's knee, ankle, um, hip, low back, we'll, we'll do a lot of foot stimulation as part of that because I've only had positive results from it. Have, have what you duration, tried... would you, sorry, what duration? Um, it depends on the application. So sometimes we'll do like a basic, you know, a strength 
protocol, which would be eight to 10 seconds contraction, 40 to 50 seconds relaxation. So sometimes we do a pure isometric strength protocol. Sometimes we'll do it as a, a TENS application where it's just a continuous current. And it's just for more of that sensory piece, I guess. And it's just, you, we do it for about 10 to 20 minutes and we do it pretty as high as they can uh, tolerate as a continuous sort of current. Um, and then I've done it as a pulsing mode as well, just to kind of relax the feet if the arches are tight or if we have like plantar fasciitis and things like that. So it depends on the application, but yeah, they're usually 20 minute sessions. Okay. So can you, I just ask with the, the arches thing, have you tried to do anything on the top of the foot where you're trying to actually create a compressive force where you're actually trying to set arches or are you going for like the pronate supinate kind of model? Or I mean, have you, have you tried? I haven't, I, I honestly, I haven't done a lot of stuff on the top of the foot. The only time I have is if there's any specific, you know, pain or, or, or you know, I'm trying to settle pain but um, mostly uh, the underside of the foot for the most part. Um, and like you said, it, even just the strengthening of the arch, um, we've noticed some, some improvements there in terms of just gait patterns, but um, it's certainly something I would mess around with more. Like I'm not a foot expert by any means, but um, I think there's something there. Cool. Thank you. Derek, yeah, Derek I, got a, I got a question, Derek. So something you mentioned piqued my interest. So, you said your starting currents for your father or your son was, you know, X units and, and depends on the age and the type of body. Have you ever tried it before and after a warm up? Like, like the current? Um, because that, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like it depends. Like, so uh, if you get somebody warmer, right? So if you increase their body temperature, then the resistance will decrease, right? So then you will require, like even in, in, in um, a session of muscle stim, you'll find that say, if I start at 15, people will report that as they go through the session, it feels more intense so that you can dose yeah. it down, right? So down to 10 because they're heating up and things are just, yeah. you know, just like warm up, right? Um, now, if you do it after a workout, a full workout, then you'll need more current because there's a fatigue component to that, right? So yeah you know, it's kind of like exercise, right? That's, that's the way you have to kind of assess it. It's no different than exercise. So if you have a prolonged warm up, you'll probably fire a little more efficiently. If you do too much, you'll probably need more juice to kind of get things going. So it's, I think if you're a good coach, you probably know how to use this. Yeah, I'm just curious because I know Charlie liked to prescribe like 2000 meters of tempo, you know, every second day. And one of the reasons why is because it helps your capillary system and your, 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 your whole, you know, your whole body circulation and uh yeah so morning i'm just curious i, I will try yeah, it the, will. The, the the only um i'm not gonna say it's a drawback but it, there is a convenience factor of hooking these things up and if you have multiple athletes you know you, don't, you need a lot of units and it's just it takes time to set everything up so if you're dealing with one specific case it's easier one athlete they have like i have a complex wireless system where they have these little like hockey pucks that they stick onto you that they're, they have their own power supply, but they're a little cumbersome because now you got these things hanging off of you. It looks like a cupping session, right? Um, so, you know, if the wires, I don't mind having wires hooked up to people, but I think the technology might change in the next little while. They'll have more portable devices and all that, but it's just a convenience factor of hooking them up and you got to make sure you clean off the skin. Otherwise the pads, the adhesive pads get, you know, dust and, and dirt and oil yeah. collected on them. But yeah, if, if you, if you don't mind doing that, I think it's beneficial. Hey, Derek, can you talk about ARP? Cause I think this would uh, be fascinating for the, the people, uh, the audience here to, to listen. Derek had this stimulus machine that actually worked through the vagus nerve. Well, it, it's just, it's, it's purported to be a DC current device. So, um, you know, there's a little more unidirectional flow with it. It's, it's very expensive. If you look up ARP wave, like you'll spend $18,000 on a unit um, and there's specific protocols and it's, it's a very, you can turn it up very high. Like it's kind of a comfortable current, but you can turn it up very high and create a, a significant stimulus and it's useful. Like I, I have a unit, I didn't pay for it. So, you know, I'm not going to be complaining, but it, 18,000 is a lot. So a lot of pro athletes that I've worked with have purchased them and used them but I think there's other ways to get around that in terms of, you know, other, other devices, but you can work on that concept. Like the whole thing with the ARP is they tried to turn it up as high as an athlete could tolerate. 
and then turn it up in the next session even higher and even higher and even higher. <laughs> and so I think what ends up happening is that people are able to tolerate high levels of stress and stimulus and still stay relaxed and calm. And I think a lot of hamstring pulls happen out of just fatigue and anxiety. And then the muscle doesn't want to lengthen because it thinks the stimulus is too high or the, the stress is too high. And that's when you get tears and avulsions and all that. So I, I find it interesting how they use it. Um, I use that, I use that vagus nerve stuff with my mom as part of her rehab which was a placement here and on, on the vagus nerve here. Um, and it worked really well. So I don't know if there's a lot of, I mean, there's definitely a lot of science out there on vagus nerve stimulation for everything from Crohn's and chronic fatigue and um, inflammation. I think that's really interesting. I don't know if anybody's used it for athletes, but most of the devices that are marketed right now are very expensive, but um, you know, I think it's interesting just for inflammatory response. Richie, you look like you want to ask questions. Yeah. I was curious a couple of things. I'll just ask one now. Um, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. You wouldn't be able to do as many exercises with it or any at all, but have you ever used EMS with needling for primarily for like recovery or pain management? I, I don't, I don't do it personally, but the PT that I work with does needling. Um, and uh, one thing we discovered was that the, uh, the devices that come for needling are relatively underpowered. So he's like, well, we bought some alligator clips and hooked up a conventional, one of the stims that I use. And he hooked it up and almost like, you know, the guy almost crapped his pants because it was such a higher level of intensity to go directly into the muscle, right? right. Because you have the pads are, you know, meant to go through adipose tissue and all that, the superficial right. stuff. So it's a lot more. So just be careful there. Um, yeah, luckily we knew the guy really well. Um, but yeah, uh, I think uh, the the needling, um, the devices that come for needling have less functions. It's either um, sort of like a general TENS or you can create some little pulses and all that. Yeah. But some of the more advanced devices, I think I would try to rig them a bit and use the alligator clips with the needles and try some different currency, uh, different current levels and different stimulus or frequency levels and try to mess around with it. So we're kind of doing that. Just, you know, we had a little bit of a hiccup at the beginning. Well, kind of the same principle, except it gets it directly there instead of yeah. indirectly. Yeah. yeah and, the, and and some, some of the patients who do not like needles have responded well with just the, the superficial pad. So it's, it's nice to do both, I guess. All right. So, so I know Pennsylvania, you can do needling. In New Jersey, where I live, you can't do needling. Is there, are other states... Country. We have to, for our, for our athletes, if you're an adult, you can, the, our trainer did it for me, but if you're, they're an athlete, they have to have parental permission and we have a form. So, yeah. Okay. And, and many of them do that. But at my horror story on that, Derek was, uh, it was like SI joint and, and hamstring. And he said, Oh, I'm putting one of the needles right in your sciatic nerve. And I felt, I mean, I felt it quivering. I said, well, I, you got it. I can feel it. And then he did the, you know, he kept doing it, the pulsing and it wouldn't work. And he finally said, hold on a minute. Well, apparently what happened was the batteries were bad. And while I'm sitting there relaxed, talking to somebody else, he shoves new batteries in and it was a lightning bolt from my big toe to my rear end. Uh, so that was my bad story on that. But otherwise it worked well. That, that set me back a couple of days, but otherwise it was pretty good for other athletes and for me. Um, yeah, it, it's it's not going to, I'm not going to say it's not going to kill somebody, but you can get a nice little shock there. And Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. I had a question. Hi, Derek. I've hey, seen you on a bunch of those um, PC, all those high performance stuff earlier in the months. <laughs> so thanks for being here. This is great. Um, I had some questions um, about you had a list in the beginning of your presentation on all the different stems and i know there's the small little pocket kind all the way up to when i was had like a plantar issue when they were doing that i think it might have been that high <laughs> stem thing that was like it felt like needles going through yep. her so bad um i don't know if it really worked <laughs> i don't really but, but anyway um and I know a lot of those people are, are, they started like the small pocket ones started at like 200 and now they're 40. And so you recommend um, even that type of level of um, stim 
stim machines or stim type of things? Yeah, I don't think they operate much differently, but what, what it comes down to is the quality of the unit, unit, the warranty behind it. So I always, I go with, I do work in Canada with Compex yeah. because it's, it's a Swiss company. They've been around a while. They have a good warranty on them. The quality of the components are very good. Mm -hmm. um, the wires and the charger and all that sort of stuff. So it works really well. Um, and then the pads you can get for it, like the pads that you buy from that company are a little more expensive, but if you go on Amazon, unfortunately, Amazon's destroying the world, but yeah. they have really good prices. Um, yeah. so you can buy aftermarket pads on Amazon for way cheaper. So, um, but yeah, Compex is one of the companies that, that, that I kind of have stuck with just because I have a unit from 2002, 2003 still works really well. Wow. I just had to replace the battery. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I really wanted to know this because there's so many things out there and you see different coaches with different things, but what's the good ones? What are the thing, you know, they're $30 now. Wait, is it going to break quickly? Is it really okay? I mean, so thanks for that. Yeah. Like I would say you could probably get away with like a $200 compact unit and be pretty happy with it. Cause there's a lower end compact unit where we get all the patients at the clinic to purchase. They get it covered partially by their insurance mm -hmm. and uh, with a doctor's note. And, and it just has the, it has a couple of strength functions. It has a couple of pulsing massage functions. It has okay. a tens function. They're fine. Uh, okay. That's all you need. But the, my, my only concern, if you go to Amazon and you buy the $40 one, I don't know how long that's going to last and how well it's supported. Um, so it might, and a lot of the time I'll try some of those units and they just yeah. feel a little sharper and they're not as comfortable. And right. it has to do with the power supply. If the power supply is a little larger and uh, it's more comfortable, if it's a little cheaper, the components are a little cheaper, it feels right. a little sharper. So. Yeah. Okay. No, that's great. I mean, especially hearing it from you. So thanks a lot. I yeah. And, a, and I encourage you to, to, to dive in and, and, and you yeah. get one, you got to, you experiment with it. And then the more, yeah. again, the more you use it, the more you're like, okay, I get how this works and what I can use it for. And so. Right. Okay, Derek, here, here, here's a question for you, Derek. An athlete has just finished, uh, let's say the heat uh, warm up. I mean, uh, not a warm up. He had a qualifying heat. heat. Uh, what? Qualifying, Our qualifying heat. heat. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you ever, thought of using the EM, the EMS machine as a way of helping them, how do you say, uh, uh, lower their, um, excited, uh, excited, their neural excitation. So that way they're able to recover in between heats. I mean, I would only do that if you have a history of doing that with the athlete, even in mm -hmm. like a, a demo in workouts and, you're not going to go like, Hey, let's try this at the Olympic trials. Right. Oh like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So if you have some sort of, uh, protocol around how it's done, what works best, and you've kind of tested it out, you know, and maybe some really, uh, meets that don't really matter and, and some practice sessions, and then you can figure out what that, that the time is because it maybe only need five minutes of it and it has to be spaced out by, you know, just like your stretches, right? What's the optimal time to do the stretch? how much separation before the next activity. Um, and those are things you have to work out through trial and error to some degree. So I, I would say as long as you've, you've figured that out and you have some confidence with that particular athlete, because everybody's different. Like we have some people, we put it on them, they can turn it right up. And they're like, yeah, I feel great. You have some people where they just kind of, you know, they get a little shock effect and it kind of freaks them out a bit. So just make sure you understand, um, the athlete and what the history is using that, that protocol. What about using it for sleep or getting them ready for sleep? Again, it's the same sort of thing. Like I know yeah. people who can like drop an espresso like two hours before they go to bed. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I, if I like sniff caffeine, you know, after dinner, I'm done. I can't sleep. So um, yeah, I think it, it's going to be based on their unique nervous system and, and maybe something on the feet you know, may settle somebody down, maybe something on the, on the traps may settle somebody else down it, but I think it is very individual. So you have to kind of test that out. But it, a lot of the time, even like a lot of people think when they put this thing on, they have to turn it right up. And sometimes you do, right. If it's an excitatory thing, but sometimes you just need a very, very little amount, just like the stretching, right? Like a three out of 10, 
and it'll settle somebody down. But if it gets too high, it can create soreness. And so it's something you really have to, to work out over time with somebody. Talked about this yeah, a lot of other subjects, even in micro stretching, that it's sort of a, an American or a North American, probably in Canada too, notion built into us that if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't do any good. Yeah. Whether it's training, whether it's stretching, whether it's this, whether it's anything. And so that's, you know, the notion that you can actually get benefit from something that you don't feel that intensely is kind of something you've got to, you've got to teach people because that's not natural. Yeah. There's like a, there's like a moving sort of sweet spot for everybody. Like you don't necessarily know that it's the same for everybody, but you know, it's kind of there and you just got to find out what that, that intensity is for that particular application. If it's recovery and rest and relaxation, well, maybe it's a little lower for me than, than Jimson. I don't know, but you, you certainly have to take notes and, you know, it would be really neat if there's somebody made a device where maybe some of these ones that are controlled through the smartphone, where it just records all your protocols and then gives you an average. Yeah. And so, you know, that would be really cool, but I have to do it all by hand right now with the, with everybody I use it with. I just write down, okay. And, and do some sort of perceived benefit score that you, Hey, how'd you feel that time? Oh, out of 10, like oh, I was a seven that felt, you know, so it, it does take some work, but I think, I think the more you use it, you do get a feel for it too, especially on yourself. You're Alan. your you're your best guinea pig. Yeah. Alan's got a question for you. Yep. Hi, Derek. All the way from Scotland. How are you doing? Ah, I'm part Scottish somewhere. Yeah, my my Answer. father's side. Oh, yeah. cool. Well, Norwegian Norwegian Scottish somehow. So, yeah. Yeah. Rusburg's Norwegian as well. If you go far enough back. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Now, the latest thing came to over here in the UK and in Scotland to see some massage hammers. Oh yeah. I get the feeling. Coaches and athletes are using them instead of using like a sim or a tens machine, just to give a little bit of feel good, and then they're doing the next rep, doing the next session when they're not fully recovered. What's your views on that? I, I I'm like I'm probably like you, where I'm very careful. Like like and Nikos and I talked about this 20 years ago about anything overly intense is going to create a fatiguing effect. And that's where you get the relaxation, right? But what is the downside of that fatiguing effect on function and, and things like say, say, Oh, I'm going to work on my quad. I'm going to beat the hell of it with this percussive instrument. Well, how is your quad going to fire in order to protect your knee now? Um, so I think you got to be really careful with this stuff. Uh, it may feel good, but what, what is the long-term impact on the function um, and the capacity of those muscles that you're hitting? So like Nikos and I would talk about like aggressive trigger point therapies where, you know, people are just grinding it and then, oh yeah, I feel relief now because everything is just uh, yielded, right? They're just like, oh, okay, we're not going to, and then it comes back. And I think that, you know, there's, is there a learning component to beating the hell out of your muscles? Probably not, but there certainly is a learning component to, stretching it properly, using EMS effectively. And that, that's why I like the EMS because it's more of a neurological uh, pathway into your system. So you're, you're, you know, like Richie said, you're looking at how much is enough to, to get it just right. And you're quantifying it. Yeah, you're, you're quantifying it. Whereas I don't know how you quantify a, a, a hammering, drill, whatever, reciprocating thing. Um, so... I, I, I see people using them all the time now and they just, Oh, I feel great. Right. And well, you're not running any faster, you know? So well, I don't one, know. One of the things that happens uh, from any percussive work or even use of um, IMS intramuscular stimulation is that the effect that that relief that like Derek was talking about, that relief that you get in the muscle is because the neural system has been taxed to its limit and it's going to let go. So, for instance, if this was a needle and I put it into a trigger point, what happens is that as the needle enters the trigger point, the muscle grabs for dear life and holds onto that needle for a long time. And eventually the neural system is going to fatigue and all of a sudden you're going to get that release. But it's a short-lived release and it's not going to change anything because it's working through a pain stimulus. And then the next day you're going to have to repeat it again. So it's the fatigue of the muscle itself that gives you that release, but it's not a long lived release. It's like waterboarding. Thanks. You'll get the answer, <laughs> but. <laughs> hey, um, hey, first, first thing, cause uh, this was set for my school setting. So now everybody can put a chat into everybody. 
we don't let our kids chat with each other. So uh, I can't tell who said, put it, somebody, maybe George Jimson said, I can't put it ever. Now you can. Um, but also on the, um, as Derek was saying too, with the EMS, you get some, you get the feedback of, okay, it's too high. I feel it, you know, so I can tone it down unless you're a masochist. You know, with the hammering part, I guess the only feedback is, okay, that hurts like heck. And some people think that's good, but you know, the EMS, you get a little more control and a little more feedback as well, because you know, I know when somebody's turned it up on me and everything just goes like that, it's like, hey, that's too much. And then here, and then after a while, I may say, okay, you can tweak it up a little bit. You're getting feedback from your response to it. It's hard with that. You know, I've seen the percussive thing. They take them on USA teams and the trainers have them. One of my athletes has them and they pass it around. It's a fad. Um, now that doesn't mean everything that's a fad is bad, but people use it only because they see other people using it. Yeah. Right, yeah. Think, one of the things that is measurable, one? like what? the electronic current's measurable. Yeah. But for, for the pulsation right. machines, you could be pushing down on it or you could not be pushing down on that changes. There's a lot of variables that are in there. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, um, Jimson and I sold a, a, an EMS unit to a guy who had erectile dysfunction. Um, and uh, hey, we are Joy. over sixty, so we have to mute. We have to mute Joy. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, "Oh, what are you using it for?" He says, "Well, can I take the adhesive pads? Can I cut them into small circles?" Right? And he was putting it on his like perineum. And then he would turn it up for an hour to maximum <laughs> intensity. And, I'm, and we're like, really? H how was that? He's like, it works, right? That's, yeah. That sounds like a prison story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He said it worked. So, I, hey, all the power to him. His name okay. was Dr. Ball. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I yeah. think he was a dentist. Yeah. Can anyway, I just I have... chip? Yeah, that got, brought, that got do... Tom awake. Uh, no, I'm, I'm actually going to go back to the, the Theragons, uh, sadly. Um, that story sounded like bollocks anyway. Um, <laughs> no, it's a true story. Uh -huh, a true story. Bollocks, I get it. I love it. Good one, Tom. <laughs> you have to translate that for some of the... Uh, uh, I got I, it. I, it. I got the it. The other side uh, of the Atlantic. If we're not careful, Nikos will tell his new fee joke again. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. But um, just with the Theragun thing, what Alan was saying, um, totally agree what Tim was saying, is that you can't really measure it. Um, and, I, and I totally agree with what Nikos was saying, is that it's an acute effect, it's not a fix. And a lot of people using them thinking that they're fixing things. But where I've actually had some sort of use with them is if I've got someone in the gym and I want to get them through a set of presses or pulls, and I know that they have some underlying issue with their levator scap or their pec minor, and that's interfering with that movement, you, you can actually get an acute effect that will then give them a better set. And then if you've got someone who you know that their glute med probably isn't working as well as you like, and you know that they have a TFL that's interfering with that, you can sometimes maybe release the TFL then you immediately go into your glute med exercise and over time it can actually help that muscle you know come to the party um and there's there's things to look for like the certain symptoms of pain or postural symptoms that will so sometimes give you clues about how you can use those things so it, it's like um it's like richie said that not all fads are bad like i think a lot of people misuse them but um, I've, I've found that it's like a, a quick man's massage and you can sometimes get acute effects where you get better work out of them. Well, that's but, the same thing with PNF stretching. People who use them on the field because it's going to be a quick, acute response, which is going to release that muscle and allow the athlete to continue doing what they're doing. You know, But it's just, I think the idea is that we've got to sort of impress upon people that these are acute responses, but they're not chronic, uh, long lasting effects, which I agree I with think, you too. But it goes back to what Derek said about that might come at a price. Yeah. So if you've got someone who they deliberately, the, the nervous system doesn't want them to get to a certain range. Right. Um, and if you use PNF, it might be like, well, maybe you don't want them at that range. But, exactly. But if, you, but if you know the athlete well enough, <clears throat> and if you know the tissue that you're trying to target, you can sometimes quite safely, like it, because it, it's a load that you know they can do, or it's it's a rehab exercise. You can get positive effects from those things. It's just it's it's not it's not going to fix anything. 
Oh, and not, I, yeah. Sorry, not, to, Rich. Not trying it out on an inexperienced athlete in some random competition where you may have, oh. you know, a bad thing. Hour and a half before Olympic final, when you've had a round that morning, <laughs> or, yeah, do it. Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah, you do it. You do it there. So there are times to pick. Hey, I've got another one that asking Derek if you've heard anything about this, or even Nikos, because I've. Um, this is something my son actually had, my younger son, and I'm going to pull it up because I. It's just a tricky paroxysmal kinesogenic dyskinesia, which is basically a tremor, like a involuntary in his case, major tremors set off so like restless leg syndrome. No, it was, yeah, it's that, but sort of to a maximum. Mean, he would have it, especially when he wrestled, you know, oh, okay. ten set, you know, in wrestling, your intense exercise, your, your, you know, isometric contraction. And he would go to where he would get shakes and tremors that would take over his leg, shoulder, body. He'd lose strength. He'd lose, or he'd have to quit, you know? So is there any, have are you familiar with any things like that of people who are normal in every other way but they have that come on at times from stress or intense activity or something and any notion of of using anything like this any types of electrical stimulation to treat uh i mean i haven't i haven't heard of that in that respect i mean i mean um i i would be interested in trying something like and and seeing if that if the stimulation itself would kind of almost distract the nervous system from that particular issue and and, and get it to focus on something else um you know even in that stochastic resonance fashion right you're injecting some noise into the system to kind of bring things down and calm things down so yeah. i would certainly um i would look at that i would probably focus on like neck and traps uh, upper extremities and maybe along the spine, but what about to... the vagus nerve, Derek? I mean, it sounds like he's getting an overreaction of the sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's something that I would, you know, try to try some different trials over time and see how, I mean, the problem is like, you don't want to have to elicit that response. Like, hey, I mean, can you... we actually, and he's, he's done wrestling. He's in college. We actually had, we actually had to, the neurologist who is a top one here in Houston, the med center, you know, in a practice got with the coach, got there to do intense activity, sit up push-ups, and intense wrestling while I filmed it to precisely elicit it for him to see what kind of, how long it took, where it took it and then what the results were. And it was, I mean, it was just ugly and hell, you know, and people what did the say, neurologist say? Well, that, you know, he would, and he did, he sent him home with all the things on his head, scalp for 24 hours and other kind of testing. And then we did a, a version of that with push-ups and sit-ups running up downstairs at the office and then tested. And that, that was when he finally, you know, he said that they really couldn't find anything wrong with anything. I mean, they were thinking, is this early sign of Parkinson's and something like that? But the result oh. was the best analysis he had was this kinesogenic dis dyskinesia um which is a identified thing that that once i looked up then it, everything kind of made sense that that seems to me to be the best uh the best description of what he had but there were there also the, what he told him then is at you know 17 was there are medications that can maybe dissipate some of it but not make it go away but the Sim, you know the the results of the medication far outweigh any you know the basic the thing you do is avoid things that make it happen uh so some and i don't even remember what the results of the medication were but they were obviously not worth it unless you know so anyway but yeah but that was he didn't have any idea and i didn't think to ask him if there any i mean he didn't think or even suggest it but i just made me think when you're talking about ems in terms of stimulating things uh, well, the, 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 inter the interesting thing with the ARP is that a friend of mine would do it like very intensely on a continuous basis. And he said that he had built exceptional tolerance to like cold. So like mm -hmm. he could go do the Wim Hof thing, stand in the, and that's all Wim Hof is doing, I think is controlling his nervous system, right? And so, his inflammatory system. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So he was using the, the electrical stimulation at high intensities so that he could go, you know, fall in a, snowbank and and not he did would never shiver he had some control over his nervous system so maybe there's something there um to look into in terms of nervous system response at certain 
levels of, of stimulus, like whether it be cold or, or whatever exercise related, I would look into it though, build up a tolerance. Richie, my question to you then would be how much into a workout would this thing uh, show itself? Was it closer to the end of a, of a wrestling match where it he's depended. been going at it? Yeah. It depended on the intensity like in a practice, like more because the coach just didn't have him do like the conditioning stuff there because that tended to set it off. Uh, if he went intensely for, you know, one minute, it might start a little and he rested and it may stop. You know, in matches, they did three one-minute rounds. And his he was pretty good. His deal was if he didn't pin the guy in the first round or the first 30 seconds of the second round and it got really intense, he would lose strength and the guy would end up pinning him. I mean, he literally just couldn't keep right. And I was worried about then him tearing a knee, tearing a shoulder because he was so fatigued. But thankfully, that didn't happen. But, uh, you know, it was just something that, you know, it came on. And, and, you know, we eventually had to alert referees ahead of time and other coaches because people would kind of freak out. It was, I mean, he couldn't stand up at the end of matches. Sometimes it would get so bad. So, What about his uh, breathing? How heavy was the breathing when he, uh, this onset of this happening? Was it you know, sharp? Was it fast? Was it? Think thinking back, it was probably real, you know, like p almost panning. But I, I'm not sure how much that was a result of that. Ha I, you know, I don't know. I, I I can't even remember. It's been a couple of years. I just was kind of curious because it sounded interesting. Thinking of EMS as something maybe that that could help control or treat or moderate that. You know, or it might help him develop tolerance. Yeah, it's just well, like a, a training now, stress response. Yeah. Now he does, he does, you know, ropes courses and outdoor stuff. He leads that stuff. And I think he just doesn't do stuff intense enough for it to happen. <laughs> you know, his way of moderating now is not being that intense. But I was thinking more of some other athlete had problems with tremors or things like that. Uh, and, I, and by the way, there's something that, and I, I, I won't be able to think of his name. He died a few years ago, but he was at the University of Chicago, but he wrote several very famous books on neurology and one that was on a bunch of vignettes on athletes and neurological issues. Uh, it was called why Michael couldn't hit. Yeah. I have that book. Yeah. Yeah. And it, the, the, it, his first one was why the man mistook his wife for a hat, something like that. That was one of his books. And, but it had some interesting things about some very interesting neurological things that affect athletics from, you know, golfers with yips from, the nervous response of gripping too hard to, you know, all sorts of other things. But anyway, some really interesting, you know, applications that most people just think, Oh, that's your body. Something's not working well. Neurologically, there are reasons for it. And maybe as a result, there are treatments for it. Uh, hey, let's bring in Kevin Reed. Kevin, you're looking, uh, how about your experiences with uh, working with your athlete? You know, have you used the MS? You're, You're muted. muted. There you go. There we go. Um, I, I haven't really used it in a group setting, you know, kind of like it's just, you know, the more people that kind of get involved, it gets, you know, just more and more complicated. Um, yeah, but we used it um, in terms of recovery. Um, I used it with Brian a lot, um, kind of post-workout. And I've actually used it a lot with, uh, with baseball players that I work with and pitchers. Um, and that, I mean, it really, I mean, it really accelerated, um, recovery time for those pitchers. Um, you know, you know, kind of, you know, after a start, you know, after a couple of days of relief, you know, and they get a couple of days off, um, you know, there's always a significant difference, you know, and, you know, and sometimes you don't do it, um, you know, because of cir circumstances and, and that kind of, you know, just don't have time, this, that, or whatever. And, oh, yeah, I mean, lots of examples, you know, of looking back and seeing, you know, much more recovery um, using it. The, the, the product that we use, and I mean, I, I don't know, if, I think it's a little bit more in the baseball world. Um, uh, Derek, I don't know if you, know, have you heard of it. Um, it's called the Mark Pro. Yep. Um, you know, that's, I got into it just because that, you know, was kind of in the baseball world and that's how I got introduced to it, at, le at least initially. And, you know, saw good results with that. And we just kind of stayed with the Mark Pro. Um, 
you know, on that line. And, you know, I've, we've been pretty happy with it. And I still, I guess I still use it, you know, more to, on an individual basis. I don't do a group setting, um, you know, just budgetarily. I don't have the funding and, and the resources to get a bunch of units. Um, but I would, if I could. Yeah. The Mark pro is kind of like a unifunctional, like it's, it's geared towards recovery. So it just has kind of the same um, setting and you just kind of have a big knob that's intensity, right? So it, it's very easy to use. I think that's why people gravitate towards it. Yeah. I mean, I mean one question, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you, Derek, cause I, you, you may know, you know, I mean, one of the big things that, that Mark pro talks, you know, talks about, you know, at least in their advertising, you know, um, as they're trying to sell their, you know, a few hundred dollar units over the, the cheap ones, you know, on Amazon and that kind of stuff is they talk about um, different levels of frequency and, and that they can hit higher free that, that, or that they hit higher frequencies <coughs> <coughs> that they can hit higher frequencies kind of out of their units and they're more effective. What's your take? I mean, you're smarter than me on that, but. Um, I mean, that's, that's what, uh, I mean, most of the uh, different companies will try to differentiate saying, yes, we, we hit this frequency or so where we have a proprietary frequency. And, um, you know, I, I mean, the biggest, for me, the biggest obstacle to use is just getting people to use it uh, consistently. So I think it doesn't matter necessarily which device you, you purchase. Are you using it at the right time of day? post-workout and they're using it consistently and then you're going to get results just like anything. Right. So, um, you know, I, I don't have any personal experience with the Mark pro. I know there's some proprietary, um, you know, marketing around it and all that. And I talked to the, the fellow, um, who's the, uh, he's the anti ice guy, Gary Rinal. I don't know if you know him and he uses Mark pro as part of his, treatment for post-injury he doesn't use any ice he thinks ice is ridiculous um and so um you know i I think like i said even for joy like get get it if you get a device and you have have some comfort using it and knowing when to use it you're going to get just like anything you're going to get better with that tool so yeah um at the very least you know most people should have a unit like most athletes i work with like i try to get them to at least have a unit that they can use and once they get into a routine, it works really well and they all are happy they have it. Here, here's a pragmatic question because we actually have a person in this panel that's looking at a hip replacement soon. Richie, you shall be nameless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about, uh, do you have access to a stim? And if Derek could actually recommend something, I know this it's kind of hard because Derek has to be there, but anything that might prep him for uh, surgery pre and then a quicker post recovery. Well, like, like in any of these injuries, like, you know, if you're in Canada, sometimes it takes a while to get a surgery, uh, an elective surgery. But um, so I'll have people doing a lot of strengthening pre surgical um, intervention, right? So like using the EMS machine. Yeah. If, well, yeah, if they, especially if they can't do it voluntarily, but, um, you know, if they can do something where they're just sitting or standing, um, I'll get them to, you know, strengthen the quad and build up that, that, that muscle heading into the surgery. And then it's a much quicker return. Uh, and then pretty much they're using it at least pulsing initially, uh, for the first few days after surgery, like, you know, if it's just a, a same day surgery, you're using it that evening and you're trying to minimize the amount of meds that you need as well. Um, so, well, and, yeah. and actually, yeah, I, I do. I mean, I sort of, I've got to get, got to arrange cause we're not on campus fully yet, but we have some units that I've used before. I could probably get one because the last time I had this done five years ago, I had a cortisone shot six months ahead and felt so much better that I did a lot of strengthening and stability work going into it and was great coming out had no problems this time I have so much even with the cortisone shot didn't work well have so much pain everywhere literally for the last I moved it up from November to two weeks from now because I couldn't make it to November I mean walking sitting standing pain and I literally tried the other day to do a little just simple stand sips, stand sits for hips and glutes and, and 
I can't do them. So that's, that's, I didn't even think of that. That's a great idea. Cause I yeah. can sit there with tens on, uh, because otherwise the next week and a half, I'm not really able to do much except limp my way in there. Uh, so that's a good a idea. Yeah. You can strengthen it that way. And you know yeah. why you're, it's a lot difficult because you've compensated to that leg for many years, which is yeah. another reason why you're feeling that. But no, I think that would be a great idea. And then coming out of it, uh, using the stem itself, because one of the things you're going to see is as the scar tissue is being laid down, if you use the stem and you cause a gentle contraction, that may help the fibroblasts align more in a parallel fashion, which may yeah. help recover a lot faster. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, they, they, Derek, on that topic too then, because we were talking about the ice and using EMS afterwards instead of using ice, what about Normatec for recovery or for, you know, other types of, of issues. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I find it interesting, but, uh, in somebody who's healthy, like what's Normatec doing is it's, it's, it's physically externally creating flow when it's like, well, why don't you just do a cool down? Um, or at the very least, at least when I use the electrical stimulation, I'm, I'm prompting my muscles to be involved with that recovery. Whereas the Normatec, you're just sitting there and it's, you know, it's like passive. Yeah, it's passive. And, and then there's going to be an adaptation to that as well. And you might be detraining some qualities. So I'm, I'm a little, I understand, like, I think they were originally created those types of sleeves for post-surgical applications, like a lot of things. Right. And then, oh yeah, I'm healthy. And you see people like sipping uh, protein shakes and sitting with Normatec sleeves on. And I, I don't think it's necessary all the time, but it's, it's kind of like a, a fad trend, but I think in your case, it might be useful post-surgical um, just to help with the circulation. But at the same time, I, I don't know how much, I mean, if you have access to them, great. I wouldn't, uh, some people go out and purchase them. I would probably just use my stem. No, we put, have, yeah, we have our own. So. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I would take advantage of it periodically just to help with circulation and um, you know, it's, it, it's probably a good thing. Um well, oh, Jimson, were you the one that sent that email out earlier today about the doing the ice cold shower every morning? Yeah, that was me. Yeah. Did you see where I was once the water temperature coming out of the shower in Houston now is about ninety degrees. So <laughs> it feels barely feels barely cool. So that doesn't that, that works if you're in Canada or maybe in California, but it doesn't work here too well. <laughs> or England for that matter. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, I just finished watching the Eco Challenge on uh, Amazon and watching these people get hypothermia and stuff. It's like, great. It's like you just watch these people get tortured. So, <laughs> No, it's crazy. Any other questions? I think this is really interesting that Derek's, yeah. you know. Yep. Anybody? Peter? I, I, um, you may recall there was a, a snooker player. Uh, I think his name was Bill Werbenick. Who had a natural he used to shake and he consumed he drank beer <laughs> calmed it all down in fact i think he got sponsored by heineken now instead of him drinking the beer what would what would he do with the, the ems what would 